And thank you so much for joining me today. I know you're all really busy, so I want to jump in with value that I hope helps you make better decisions. If you're going to prison, if you have a loved one in prison, I'm filming this video for you. Uh, I received a call last evening from a, a wife whose husband is in a, in a minimum security camp, and she was crying, and I listened, and after many minutes, I, I said, well, tell me exactly what happened. Her husband was not a client of our company. And she said, my husband got caught outsourcing his job, paying someone to do his job. And I said, oh, what was his job? She said he was supposed to be an orderly, and it wasn't the best orderly job. And someone came up to him and said, hey, if you don't want to do your job, you know, pay me a couple of books of stamps a month, and, and I'll do it. And he said, OK. And he got caught. So I want to film this video to help all of you understand the underground economy in federal prison because this wife is devastated and her husband's in the SHU because of course it's a disciplinary, the SHU is the special housing unit. Of course it's a disciplinary infraction to pay someone to, to do your job. And now his family is enduring the consequence, time in the hole, maybe loss of, of good time, visitation and commissary restrictions. It's a significant consequence because he didn't want to do a certain orderly job that might have been tough. Maybe it's scrubbing the toilets or, or the showers. He just didn't want to do it and he seized an opportunity to have someone do the work. So as we talk about the underground economy, let's not forget that, well, one, if any of you are seeking to manipulate this warp culture of confinement, make sure you fully understand corrections before you do. Make sure you fully understand your environment before you manipulate it to your favor. Too many prisoners don't do that. Too many prisoners, as was the case with me, are kind of used to getting what you want, don't really like going without, I was lucky to have resources that would have enabled me to spend almost as much as I wanted to every single month. And because of that, it's very easy to make some bad choices. So when you step into a federal prison, whether it's a camp, medium, low, or a high, you've got to understand there are going to be some long-term prisoners there who I don't want to say are forgotten about, but who may not have the resources to shop in the commissary themselves or use email or phone. Their prison job even if they're making $40, $50, $60, $70 dollars a month, may not pay them enough to buy everything they'd like. So for that reason, they're going to engage in the hustle to subsidize and improve their lifestyle in prison. So there are many prisoners who have good intentions who will legitimately deal with you. There are many prisoners who will seek to exploit or take advantage of you. And that's why it's critical for a proactive prison adjustment to understand your tendencies. Do you know if someone's exploiting you or manipulating you? After all, how many of you are going to prison because someone exploited or manipulated you and they thought you had good intentions? So if you're not aware of your tendencies as a human being, you can ex expect someone to find that weakness inside of that federal prison and perhaps get you into more trouble um, than you need. So knowing that, let's talk about some specific examples of what the underground economy looks like. And you've got to make your own decision if you're going to pursue it. Well, I just addressed having someone do your job. Another example of the underground economy is paying someone to use an iPhone. In federal prison, we currently have 300 phone minutes a month. Now, I know that's going to change with the First Step Act, which is a good thing. We're going to get more phone minutes with the First Step Act. But for now, it's only 300 phone minutes a month. It's not a lot of phone minutes. And maybe it's the 25th of the month, you've run out of phone minutes, and something happened at home, an event, a birthday, an anniversary, some news you want to get. There could be a prisoner who could proposition you and say, hey, I noticed that you're out of phone minutes. Use this iPhone. Now, just use it one time. as a, It's fine. It's cool. Here's a little favor for me to you. Just use it. Call home. Make the call. It's all good. The next minute, month, you're out of phone minutes again. That same prisoner comes to you and says, hey, this time if you want to use the phone, it's $2 a minute. So if you want to use the iPhone, use it for 10 minutes, find a way to get $20 to me. Well, like, what does that mean, get money to you? There's no money in prison. You're not allowed to have currency in prison. Even when you're in visitation and your family brings money, you cannot touch the money. No dinero for you. Okay, you have your prisoner card. Maybe I'll put my card up here with my big fat chubby cheeks the day I surrendered in 2008. Okay, so no currency, no touching of money. So then you have to begin to inconvenience your family or friends and find a way to get that money to him. Or you can give him books of stamps, which of course is currency. So now you begin to engage in this conduct, which frankly is not as severe as the ultimate conduct of using an illegal iPhone. I've received, I would estimate, more than 50 calls from someone whose loved one has gotten in prison for illegally using an iPhone in prison, never thinking they're going to get caught. 
Sometimes it's a two minute call, a three minute call, a five minute call. Well, how do they get caught? Eventually they're going to find the iPhone. They're looking for them. And they then look at every number that was ever dialed on an iPhone. And they cross check it with every approved number because of course every number you call in prison is added to your approved phone list. They have pretty good security protocols there. Uh, I knock the BOP at times, but security is something that's very important to them and they're on top of this. So what happens? They match the numbers, they call you in. It is a significant disciplinary infraction. It's a series 100 shot, which is like murder, rape, tattooing. It's on that level. There's 100, 200, 300, and 400 level disciplinary infractions. Series 100 ain't good, and that's what getting caught with an iPhone is. And sometimes it's easily as, it's easy as being exploited. Hey, use the phone for five minutes, it's okay. Unable to resist temptation. Unable to understand there are aspects to this aspects to imprisonment that are hard aspects of this experience that are supposed to be tough and uncomfortable the question is do you have the temptate can you resist temptation do you have the ability to say no do you have the discipline which i would argue is delaying gratification knowing if your highest value is family and your children and getting out of there as quickly as you can it's going to require you to make some tough choices as much as you may want to call home and say son great job did you get three hits today i miss you i love you i can't wait to see you we're going to visit on friday i know it i get it but you've got to understand everything you think, say, and do, how that impacts not just your life, but the people that, loves, people that love and support you. I'm sorry I'm talking so quickly, but I'm passionate about this. And I'm tired of getting calls from people who their loved one went, made one bad choice and it derails all the progress they've made. Another example of the disciplinary infraction, admittedly something that I engaged in. And I, want to be, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be a walking contradiction. I engage in the prison hustle. I didn't get caught. In retrospect, I should have done it less. I did not need to do it to the degree that I did. So you've got to make your own choices. I did it, but I fully, I thought I fully understand, understood the culture of confinement before I did, but in retrospect, I didn't need to do it to the degree that I did or do it at all. So another example of the underground economy. You have $360 a month you can spend in federal prison. And many prisoners, won't spend the a lot of 360. Maybe they'll spend $200 a month. So knowing that many of these prisoners are looking for opportunities to make money in prison, they will come to you and many they're going to notice if you have resources. They're going to know if when you shop in the commissary you're leaving there with like, you know, bags and bags of stuff. Okay, they're going to know. They're going to know if you're exercising your ass off and you don't love eating in the chow hall. People are watching, they're studying. They may not talk to you but they know if how you've adjusted. They know if you talk to guards. They know the type of people you're associating with. They probably study the cars that come into the parking lot who visit you to get an idea if you have resources. Many of these minimum security camps are very small. It's easy to see if someone's rolling in in a Beamer, Benz, or Range Rover. I know it happened in my case because I had some friends who were athletes who came to see me and it's like, oh, they presume because my friends had a Range Rover and a big Rolex that I was rolling, which I was not. This is the perception. You've got to address that. So people are going to think, okay, this guy has resources. Let me propose him and entice him to see if he wants to spend more every month. So in that case, if they're only spending 200 and the limit is 360, there's $160 left. And they'll say to you, would you like that 160 Of course I would. I'd love it. The food in the chow hall sucks. It's terrible. It's awful. Of course I would. What are we talking about here? Let's make a deal. And I'll say, okay, calm down. I know you're excited. Just calm down. We're going to make it happen here. And of course, this prisoner has been in for 5, 10, 15 years. There's nothing he hasn't seen. You've been inside for 14 days and you're trying to manipulate this environment to, to, your, to your liking, to, your, to what you need, because it's very difficult to go without. So he'll then say, okay, I have 160 bucks left. Send my wife 250 bucks and I'll shop for you 160. I'm going to make 90 bucks. Deal? Done? Got it? Good. Thank you. Bye-bye. And it's like, what just happened? I engaged in and agreed to a deal with a prison hustler. Now, of course, you have to go and convenience your family, and this is the way that works. It's a Friday afternoon you're visiting, and you tell your wife or girlfriend or daughter who's devastated and distraught that you're in prison, you then have to tell her, hey, look, you're going to leave here. You're going to go get a money order at the UPS, and then you see that woman over there in the corner? Yeah, she's very nice. You're going to go get a money order for um, like 160 bucks or 250 or whatever I said the number was, whatever, and you're going to give it to her. And your loved ones are going to say, like, well, I don't know her. Like, what are you talking about? This is crazy. And you're going to say, I, I get it. Here's the deal. That woman in the corner is going to go with you to the UPS store, and you're going to get a money order, and you're going to give it to her. And your family is going to be like, 
Um, okay. I saw it every day in visitation. So I didn't do that. I primarily engage in the economy by using books of stamps to pay people to cook. I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying there are different degrees of whether you're moving money to other inmates' books. And I know of prisoners that had money going to 10 people's books, okay? And many never got caught. Most never got caught. In my case, it was using a book of stamps, which did not go against my commissary limit to have somebody cook. But I always did, I always did my job. Now, I will say there are some things that the institution may not allow, but they kind of turn the other way from. For example, they know that some prisoners have no money coming in. They know that a prisoner serving 10 years can't afford to shop in the commissary with what they earn for their prison job. So they know there are prisoners that are cooking on behalf of other prisoners or doing your laundry or doing your sheets or ironing your pants. Or, so there are some things I would argue they, they turn away from or allowed to happen. But it doesn't change that it is a violation. It does not change that every time I gave a book of stamps to Big Homie to cook these incredible meals, and I'm not saying Big Homie disrespectfully, that was his name in prison, Big Homie. I gave him a book of stamps, that was his name. Every time I gave Big Homie a book of stamps, that I was engaging in a disciplinary infraction. Even if you give a toothbrush to a prisoner, if you give a Diet Coke or granola that is te technically a disciplinary infraction. So you've got to understand the culture. You've got to determine how far you're willing to go. Understanding that, yes, giving a book of stamps to have someone cook you a meal is measurably different, yes, than using an iPhone. It's measurably different than having somebody do your work. It's measurably different than having somebody uh, sending money to other people's books. But it doesn't change that it's a disciplinary infraction. All it takes is one shakedown or one guard or one potential camp informant who may not like you because you get a lot of visits, who may not like you because you're too upbeat, who may not like you because you're too positive, who may not like you because you're going home before him. Whatever reason, it may not change that an informant, of which there are many, may go to a, a counselor and say, hey, you know, I, I'd like to get more halfway house time. If I help you, will you help me? And they'll say, what are you talking about? Well, I know this guy is using an iPhone to call home. I know this guy's paying people um, to increase his spending in the commissary. Do you have interest? And just like that, it's blown up. And that's why I get a lot of calls from people who watch our videos and say, wow, what can we do to unwind this mess? So that's why I filmed this video today to help all of you under understand the underground economy, the pros and cons of every choice you make. And I'll close with essentially how I opened. If you've been exploited before, expect to be exploited again in prison unless you're aware of that tendency and you develop a resistance to give in to temptation and you actually master discipline. And lastly, be authentic. Make sure your values are absolute. In other words, if you say your family is your highest value, do not make any decisions on the inside that don't align with your stated value, that contradict your stated value. And if you can do that, you will actually emerge better and stronger than when you went in. You will actually get more time in the halfway house, I believe, because administrators who may not speak to you will notice that you've adjusted properly. So if your end goal is get out of there as quickly as possible, you need to be obsessed with the choices you make on a daily basis and understanding how the underground economy can derail a prison term as it did this wife's family. I am going to help them right, with, uh, manage this administrative remedy process, which I should probably talk about in another video, but I'm rambling. I'm going to wrap it up. Be careful about the underground economy. Move forward wisely. And um, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.